Thank you for having me. So there are a lot of cases that I discuss in the book, and, and many of them are, are patently absurd, and, and some of those are, are very difficult to <coughs> explain in a, a talk like this. But there's one I like to talk about because it can kind of boil it down and is perhaps the most absurd out of uh, people that the FBI and the Department of Justice have termed terrorists since 9-11. And it involves this man in suburban Illinois named Derek Sharif. And Derek was in his early 20s, and he'd recently converted to Islam. And his family was entirely against it. And actually, he gave him an ultimatum. You know, you can stay within the family, or you have to renounce your religion. And, and Derek, Derek chose Islam. And so he no longer had a place to live. He was working at a video game store, earning close to minimum wage. And it just so happened that his car had broken down. So he was in a tough spot. And it's unclear why the FBI became interested in Derek. But what we know is that they sent in an informant to his video game store. And the informant struck up a conversation. That informant happened to have been a former gang member who had dealt drugs and had worked off that charge and was now working for the FBI for money. And the informant, in the conversation with him, says, you know, how are you doing? And Derek explains his, his tough lot. And, the informant says, well, I've got a place you can live. I've, I've got a car. You know, you can eat my food. Why don't you come over? And Derek, nowhere to go, car broken down, and also being you know, newly and, in his mind, devoutly religious, thought this was the work of God because it was the day before Ramadan. And Derek says, yes, I'd, I'd love to go live with you. So he goes and stays with the informant. All the bills are being paid for by the FBI. And over the course of months, the informant slowly stokes in Derek his anger, and, and Derek is angry. He doesn't quite know why. He's angry of U.S. foreign policy. He's angry of the treatment of Muslims by the U.S. government here and abroad. And the informant says, well, what are you going to do about it? And, and Derek says angrily, I'm going I'm to kill a judge. And, of course, Derek didn't know the names of any judges. And the informant then says, well, what about, what if we attack a shopping mall? And Derek got very excited about that idea. He's like, yes, we should, we should attack a shopping mall. And that became the beginning of what seemed to be a very good sting operation for the FBI. Except there was a problem in the sense that the FBI in these sting operations need, needs more than talk. They need some kind of overt act. And they needed him to acquire weapons. Well, the problem was that Derek didn't have any money. As, as mentioned, he was flat broke. But he did have these old stereo speakers. And it was the only thing that he had of any value. And the informant says to him, well, I know this arms dealer. And I, I think we could get some grenades. And I think if you brought your, your stereo speakers to him, he'd take the stereo speakers and say, okay, trade. And you know, I don't know much about black market arms, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that no arms dealer is going to take old stereo speakers for grenades. But Derek didn't seem to know that. And Derek then says, okay, let's go. And so the, the informant and Derek go to the suburban shopping mall in Illinois. And in, in the parking lot is a man portraying himself as an arms dealer, and he's got his box. Of course, it wasn't an arms dealer. It was an undercover FBI agent. Derek hands over the grenade. Or, I'm sorry. Derek hands over the, the speakers. The agent takes them and hands over the five grenades. They were all inert, but they, they looked real. And Derek walked away just as FBI agents storm in and arrest him. And they charged him with conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction. And he's now serving 25 years in prison. What I, what I think one of the things that happened in that case that I found particularly revelatory in the work I was doing was that before he was arrested, and as they're talking about their plot to bomb a shopping mall with grenades, Derek says to the informant, you know, if it wasn't for you, referring to the informant's ability to get him grenades, I would probably just end up stabbing someone with a steak knife. And what I thought was so interesting about that was that it was, my argument in these cases is that the FBI ultimately prosecutes men as terrorists who never have any capability of becoming terrorists on their own. And here was Derek Sharif, saying, the best I can do is stab someone with a steak knife. But through this elaborate sting operation, the FBI was able to prosecute Derek as someone who was about to bomb a shopping mall with grenades and portray him to the public as a dangerous terrorist whose threat was thwarted only through the hard work of, of FBI agents. So Derek's case was one of many I'd seen since really the, the middle of the last decade. And there was some reporting done on these cases and all that I'd seen was very anecdotal. It would, it would talk about a sting case here and a sting case there, and there were questions of how many people actually posed a threat. And so I decided to pursue a project that would try to figure out, since 9-11, how many real terrorists have there been? How many people like Najib Azazi, who came very close to bombing the, the subway stations here, or Fajr Shazad, who came close to bombing 
Times Square. How many had there been of these dangerous terrorists and how many Derek Sharifs had there been? People that had no capacity for terrorism other than the FBI providing them with everything they would need. But a, a problem I ran into early in the research was how do you really define what, what a terrorism case is?